Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that all is well with you. Praise the Lord. If our focus is on you, Lord, nothing is impossible. We know, Lord, that you have made all things well for us. And we receive it, Lord, by faith. In Jesus' name, praise God. Through whatever you're going through this morning, I'm just telling you, it's well with the Lord. Amen. Just keep the focus on Him and nothing shall be impossible to you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Suzanne, for double duty again this morning. And thank you, Peter and Tammy. And this lead us in worship. Praise the Lord. And thank all of you for being here. I just want to say one thing. I do want to really thank the Lord and His using Sheila and John to make this roof and siding and all that possible. And uh, Amen. Sometimes it, it, it seemed a little confusing and we weren't real sure where things were going, but God knew from the very beginning all we had to do was just stand fast and see the Lord. Amen. And uh, obviously it's not completed yet, but uh, enough that you can see kind of what the end result will be and it's much better than what it was before. And, and uh, so thank you, Sheila, for being yes. obedient to the Lord and thank you, Lord, for just blessing us without us having any intention or even under thinking that there was a possibility. You know, sometimes he just does stuff without us even really doing anything. It just shows up and you go, wow, that was really great. Praise the Lord. So this was a good thing. Amen. And we're, we're grateful. And uh, amen. With the weather cooperates just a little bit. Amen. We should be through with it by this week. Praise the Lord. So amen. God is great. Hallelujah. Yes, I love new things. And I'm wondering now if these uh, glass coffins will be successful. It remains to be seen. <laughs> you know, in the ark, there was always these, you know, they had all the animals and everything. I, I was always curious, where did Noah keep the bees? In the archives. I'll give you a moment to get past that, praise the Lord. The groaner. But here, here's the deal. Uh, three guys are out on a boat one day fishing, and they all smoke, and they have four cigarettes, but they had nothing to light them with. So one guy gets the wise idea, he was really a genius, and uh, he threw one of the cigarettes overboard, and then the whole boat became a cigarette lighter. <laughs> Right? Four. The great lighter. There's a Mexican magician, and he, he told his audience that he would disappear on the count of three. And so he went uno, dos, and poof. He disappeared without a trace. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, well, I for one like Roman numerals. I for one like Roman numerals. I for one. Okay. Praise the Lord. Next. Yeah. I wish James was here for a drum roll, but yeah, the way we go. All right. Praise the Lord. Appreciate your worship this morning and... Uh, the song selections were great. They really spoke to what the, the Lord has uh, given me to share with you this morning. And so I'd like to uh, begin in Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll read verses 9 through 12. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 12. Praise the Lord. And Nehemiah, which is the church hathat, which that just means a Persian governor. He was the person that was put in charge in Judah to represent the Persians uh, who still held the, the Israelis captive or the Jews captive. And so Nehemiah was allowed to go and with uh, others begin to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, 
Nehemiah, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Yes. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So Nehemiah, when they're reading the, the, the word to everybody, everybody starts crying and weeping and freaking out. And he says, don't do this because... This day is holy. It's, in other words, it's separated to God. It's, it's, it belongs to the Lord. And then God tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of us that started out in religion, weeping over the fact that we didn't measure up to God's standard was the norm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times. And I'm, there's, I don't have anything against altar calls or people coming to the altar. But I mean, that's where a lot of that was. And I, I preached all around the state of Iowa when I first came up here just because I was a, a different face, I guess. And, but I'd see the same people all the time in different churches, but the same people would come to the meetings and then they would be up here crying and going on and on and on. And I understand there's an emotion involved in a lot of this. But that became the kind of the standard for everything. And we thought, well, if you're holy, you're going you're gonna to have to be crying and upset because you know you're not measuring up. You're not going to be what you, know, you were told you were supposed to be all this time. So... Holiness is something generally associated with, with soberness and tears to a lot of people. Not joy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But holiness, as I said, is being sanctified or set apart or belonging to God. Yeah. Being his personal property, basically, you know. And in fact, for us, it, we were his offspring, you know. Yeah. But in Nehemiah's story of rebuilding this fallen city of Jerusalem, you can see that the holiness is more connected with joy and rejoicing than it is with sorrow and regret. Mm -hmm. Amen. Israel was forbidden to weep when the priest publicly read the word of God. Now, I'm telling you, in most church services I was in years ago, man, all you wanted to do was cry or run because you knew that I'm just not going to make it. This is just too much, you know. And so there was constantly this condemnation and guilt and fear and anxiety about it. Amen. But they were told, do not weep. Do not cry. Amen. Because when we read the word of God, even though you fall far short of what God requires of you, he wants you to be happy. He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to be enjoying. Amen. Because of this separation. Amen. This belonging to God. Amen. So when we have a wrong view of God as a legalistic father who's unhappy with every move that we make, we distort what was supposed to lead us to an encounter with him in the first place. Yes. The word of God. Amen. And so this, this coming to him is what brings transformation. It's what changes everything. Amen. And so he kindles, and I'll get to this later on, and, and he gives himself wholly to us. Holy with the W-H, you know. And uh, the, the real problem is not what we lack, but how we respond to what God has said. Amen? Focusing on our problems more than God's answers right. ought to be a dead giveaway, amen, that we are really dealing with condemnation right. and not the Holy Spirit's conviction. Right. The Holy Spirit convicts us that we are holy, that we are righteous, that we are yes. saved, that we are children of God. That's what the Holy Spirit convicts us of. He doesn't convict us of sin. No. He convicts the world of sin. He convicts us of our righteousness. Right. Amen? So focusing on our problems more than God's answers is a giveaway, amen, that we're, our, our attention is in the wrong place, amen. Look at Romans 8 and 1. He tells us that there is 
therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk after the Spirit, or who are born again of the Spirit. Amen? There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I don't know why I never heard that preached. <laughs> well, I guess I do know why, but I wished I would have, because I, it would have made my life a lot more pleasant for a number of years. Amen? Focus on God's answers, amen, and not your problems. That's the key. That's what he's trying to get us to do. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Not the sorrow and the grieving of your coming short, but the joy of God's embracing us and his grace is our strength. Amen. Look at, let's look at this in Psalms uh, 84, verses 5 through 7, Suzanne. Psalms 84, 5 through 7. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, speaking of the Lord, and whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca, and Baca means weeping, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Now let's, let's read it again. Blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of tears or weeping, Make it a well. The rain also filled the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appear before God. John 4, verse 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Yes. Praise the Lord. He's saying... Stop the weeping. Just turn it to a pool. Turn it into a, a well. The strength, our strength is in the joy of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. When we refuse to let circumstances and areas of our life, personal weaknesses, amen, when we don't let them determine our level of faith, we're going to discover the secret of victory right. in every situation. Praise the Lord. Turn, he said, I'll turn your weeping into joy. Yes. Praise the Lord. And we thought the other way around. We thought he'd turn our joy into weeping once we came to him because we're never going to measure up. Yeah. We all, all of us, everybody, if, they're, if you're honest, every one of us realize we, we're, we don't measure up no. to the law, to the, to the no. demands right. of holiness. It's a gift. Yes. It was given to us. That's where the joy comes in. If I had to labor for this, there'd be very few happy days in my life because I'd be miserable all the time. The more I focused on this, the more miserable I'd become. But he said, when you hear the word of the Lord read, rejoice, be happy. Get a bottle of wine, get some barbecue, get whatever it is you like, and let's party. Because God has delivered us. Amen. Now, you, you might not like that, but that's what the word of God says. The first miracle Jesus did, and I'm not encouraging everybody to go out and get drunk this afternoon. I'm just saying. The first miracle Jesus did was to turn water into wine. Why? Because he wanted them to have a good time. He wanted them to celebrate. He wanted them to know the true character of God is not one who's taking away from you all the time, but always wanting to give to you. He's not trying to make your life miserable and sorrowful. He's trying to give you the joy, amen, that every day you get up, you think, man, what's, what's going to happen today? What kind of good stuff are we going to get to experience, amen, in the Lord today? Praise the Lord. Most of you don't hear that much in church. I never did. Amen. What I heard was, whoa, wait for tomorrow because who knows where the next shoe's going to drop. You know, I mean, he's going to get me. I know he is, but I just don't know how or where. Yeah. He's going to get me, but he's going to get me so he can shower me with his love. Yeah. So that he can give me the desires of my heart. Praise yes. the Lord. Amen. Mark 4, verse 40. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, Jesus said this to his disciples right after. This is right after the big storm, you know, on the lake. And they go down and wake him up. Don't you care about us? We're going to die. And, you know, the storm's going to take us under. And Jesus' response to this was after he had calmed the storm, he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, to some people that might seem a little extreme, but... That's because we think that it's our job to ask God to fix our problems, right. and it's his job to answer us. Yeah. Right. 
But Jesus was saying, I just had to do the job that I trained you to do. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus had trained every one of those disciples in that boat to do what he had to do. Mm-hmm. By faith. Yeah. Amen. It's true for all of us. Some of the things that we're begging God to do, he's already done. He's just waiting for us to respond and do what he's taught us that we can do. Speak to the mountain, deal with whatever it is, lay hands on the sick, whatever the thing might be, right? So let's look now at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. And here's here's what the point I'm trying to get to today is we, we feel inadequate. Now I'm speaking for myself when I say it's... It's the royal we, praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, we we just don't feel adequate to the the things that come up before. So we're crying out to God, help me, help me, help me. And God is saying, come on, I've given you the way to do this. Amen. I'm with you. I'm I'm in you. All you've got to do is step out here and exercise a little faith and do this thing. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, this is Paul talking. He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities or in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. So now let's look at John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. John 14, verses 12 through 14. Praise the Lord. Now, maybe I'm just talking to me this morning. Y'all might have it all together. Praise the Lord if you do. Here he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Praise the Lord. If you've ever been to a, uh, to a big revival or if you watch uh, much Christian TV, you could start thinking that God only uses these seemingly anointed men and women of God. This is kind of what Suzanne was talking about. You know, people who preach uh, to these huge crowds and uh, brilliant sermons and wear expensive clothes and have perfect hair and, you know, all the right music in the background and setting the stage for everything. But over the years, I've come to the conclusion for me personally that God wants to use ordinary, broken, sinful, weak, foolish people. People just like you and me. And he does that to advance his kingdom. And the verse that summarizes my opinion is 2 Corinthians verses 12 and 9. The weak are strong in the Lord. It's because of his, our weakness that his strength is made perfect. Amen? Paul discovered this, and in another place he talks about how God chose the weak things of this world. Why? Well, because God wants us to rely on him and not on us. He knows what we're capable of, but he knows what he's capable of as well. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 through 29. I'm going to use a bunch of scriptures here, and then we'll just move on from that. But in the meantime, I want to get this foundation laid here. And here's what he says. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. Praise the Lord. In other words, he's saying, depend on my wisdom, not on your understanding. Praise the Lord. It's all about his power in our weakness. Amen. The glory belongs to him. The problem with most religious uh, settings is that the people want the glory. Some preacher, man, woman, whatever, Some organization, they want everybody to think it's all about them. Come here and get prayed for. It's going to work and so on and so forth. Amen. But look at Mark chapter uh, 10, verse 35 through 40. Mark 10, 35 through 40. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mark 10, 
James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of that cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Praise the Lord. And so <clears throat> I have a, uh, several books on Jewish uh, tradition and culture and the religion itself. One of them is by a, a re ex-rabbi or rabbi, uh, Eidersheim. He's not living anymore, I don't believe. But he says that in the New Testament times, when rabbis chose disciples, they would go to the rabbinical schools where these people are being trained, amen, and choose the best of the best, amen. And one of the questions that they would ask themselves was, could this guy do something more than I can do? That's what they were looking for. Amen. So when Rabbi Jesus chose his disciples, to me, it looks like he went for the worst of the worst. Yeah. Amen. Now, just think about it. There's a reason for this. It's not just uh, because it's historic. It's because he's trying to tell us something as well. Yes. Amen. Whenever Peter opened his mouth, he put his foot in it. Yes. Amen. James and John were nicknamed the sons of thunder. And it wasn't because they had digestive problems. They were, would you catch up with me? Praise the Lord. But because they were hot tempered, they had attitudes. Amen. And the scripture shows that they were self serving and ambitious. Amen. Right after Jesus tells them about he's gonna, how he's going to die on the cross, all the suffering he's going to go through, they said, Well, could you do us a solid? I mean, could you do us a favor? I mean, we know you're going to go through a lot of horrible stuff and you're going to die, but you know. Before you go do all this, do, do me a favor, will you? After you're done with all that suffering, could we sit at your right hand and on your left hand and be really important people? Yeah. Jesus wasn't impressed because they were competitive. Right. They were greedy. They were selfish. Mm -hmm. And John, look at John 20, verses 3 and 4. Now, this, this is just it's comical. One, for one thing, uh, John is always almost kind of elevated up above everybody else because the one that Jesus loved. Now, that was, that's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not, I mean, Jesus loved them all the same, but he had this thing about him that, you know, he loves me more than he does them. I know he loves them, but, you know, not like me. Yeah. So look at this. This is comical almost. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, this is John. Yeah. He's writing this, you know, this is John. And he said, Peter, therefore, went forth, and the other disciple... And came to the sepulcher. And they ran both together. And the other disciple, John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. <laughs> so Peter and John run to the tomb. And when they heard that Jesus had risen from the dead, John couldn't resist telling us he was faster than Peter. <laughs> I'm serious. Look, look at John 21 and 25. So we think we're all a bunch of dolts, you know, and just... We've got our own little agendas going. This is humanity, man. I mean, this is, and Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. So he says, there are also many other things. This is John still talking. And he says, there's all kinds of stuff I, w I could write about what Jesus did. If I did, I suppose that even the world couldn't contain all the books that could be written about the things that Jesus has done. So he says, there's all these great stories that he left out. But still he thought it was important to let us know that he was the quickest over 100 meters. I mean, seriously, I mean, think about it. All the things that could have been written, that he could have written. But he decided, well, a lot of this stuff, you know, just, you know there isn't room for all of it here. And I, but he had room to let us know that he was fast on his feet. He was faster than Peter. He was better than Peter. Man, if that isn't a human, I, I don't know what is. Amen. So look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah, Elias did, or Elijah? 
right? These, they were violent. They were vengeful. You know, the Samaritans didn't treat us right. Let's burn them down. Right? I mean, that's what they're saying, can't we? Can we just cook them like, you know, smoke them? Praise the Lord. And Jesus had to have been wondering if they're ever going to get it. Another disciple, Simon, the scripture says he was a zealot. In other words, he was trying to violently overthrow the Romans, the occupying Roman government. Amen. Today, we'd call him a terrorist. Now, you may not agree with it, but I mean, it depends on which side you're on, who the terrorist is, right? Yeah. But under the definition, that's what he was. Yeah. Amen. Matthew collected taxes from his own people. Yeah. And he did it for the Romans. Yeah. And they hated him. They considered him a traitor to Israel. Thomas was probably every pastor's nightmare. Yeah. He was negative about everything. Yeah. He wouldn't believe anything. Nope. And he always saw the cup half empty. Uh -huh. yeah. No matter what it was, it was bad. It was negative. It was no. It was going to happen. Yeah. And yet Jesus chose him. Yes, he, he loved him. He was committed to him. For three years, they totally misunderstood him. But he never gave up. So let's go. I want to show you this where I, we, I spoke of this briefly in the beginning. But look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. That word breath there, or to breathe, is to kindle. He meant to stir something, to start something, right? Well, now look at John chapter 20 and verse 22. He started something with Adam. He kindled something with Adam. And then he had said this, he breathed on them and he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That word, when he breathed on him, that word means to give yourself completely, to give yourself wholly, totally. So God kindled something and then Jesus brings it into fullness, yes. into the fullness of what it is. That's the Holy Spirit that we have received when we're born again. Amen. So these guys, these disciples, they had wrong motives. But Jesus didn't give up on them. No. In the end, his love changed them and they changed the world. Yes. I've talked about it before, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves. Look all through the Bible at these people that we think of as the great, uh, you know, they are the patriarchs, but the great thing that we're to focus on and try to become yeah. like. Amen. Noah was a drunk. Yeah. Abraham was too old. <clears throat> Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was a coward. Samson was a flirt. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Uh, Elijah was suicidal. Yeah. Isaiah preached naked. I, I, yeah, try to get that image out of your head. That, that's disturbing. But Jonah ran from God. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Jesus three times. The disciples were sleeping when they were supposed to be praying at the most significant point in their life. Amen. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul murdered Christians. Timothy probably had an ulcer. Lazarus was dead. Yeah. Now, if God can use a dead man, yeah. he can use us. Yeah. I mean, that's yes. the reason why these stories are in there, not for us to yes. go, gee, I would like to be like them. You already are. Yeah. You don't have to try to be yes. like them. You are like them. Amen. Yes. What you need to do is focus on God yes. and not on that. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Jesus. Amen. So if God's power is made perfect in weakness, that has to mean that God's power is not made perfect in our strength. Why? Because when we know our weakness, we trust in his strength. Yes. I mean, when we got saved, the very initial st uh, step of salvation is what? You come to the end of yourself. You realize, I can't. this thing I'm doing, it ain't working. It's getting worse. Amen. And so in my weakness, I turn to somebody who can help me. You know, there's three things, the hardest three things to say. That is right. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I need help. And we're Chestershire or Worcestershire. <laughs> Songs. 
Well, it's true anyhow, praise the Lord. I don't like asking for help, and I don't like to say I'm sorry. I don't, because when I say I'm sorry, it means I must have done something I shouldn't have done. Praise the Lord. And with Worcestershire, I just, Worcestershire, I just, give me the, the thin, runny stuff to put on a steak, praise the Lord. If, if we're ever going to affect, I know that's awful, but if, if we're ever going to effectively reveal Jesus to the world, we've got to move from a few so-called anointed men and women, because we're all anointed, and God wants to use all of us. He's not trying to promote some individual, raise them up so everybody, I mean, come on, that's why he's put these people in here. You know, when it's, it's weird because then when we find out somebody who we've held in this high esteem who's, you know, had a big ministry or whatever, and they screw up, and then we go, oh, my God. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. I mean, it's yeah. a human. Yeah. Yeah. You made him that. God didn't. You know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. And we have our failures, and we don't have to share them all, but we have them. And, and, and all the time when we have them, they're the things that cause us to back away. You know, instead of doing what we're supposed to do and what we have been given the ability to do, we back away and think, oh, I'm a failure. You know, I just screwed this up so bad. No, you're, you're perfectly human. You're the perfect vessel for God to use. That's yes. what he's looking for. In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Yes, it is. And we just want to beat ourselves up and, you know, crawl back in a hole and you know, try to recover and weep and cry and try to redo and make it better and get better and only to fail again. Because that's what humans do. Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm not promoting it. I, I don't have to because it just happens. Amen. What I'm saying is when instead of looking at us, instead of focusing on our weakness and our failures, look to him. That's your perfection. He's the one that's going to do this and he's going to do it through you. A failure. And your weakness, his strength, is made perfect. The more you can acknowledge the fact that, hey, I'm not Jesus. I have Jesus living in me, and I'm capable of doing the things that Jesus did, but I'm flawed. He wasn't. Right. Praise the Lord. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's part of the plan. Part of the plan that we're not supposed to be perfect or think that we can do these things ourselves. It's our inability to do it that causes us to reach out to Him and to trust in Him. And then His strength yes. is made perfect yes. in our weakness. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God. That is right. That's why God loves to use weak people. Now that little scripture there this treasure in earthen vessels. It may not mean a lot to us today, but 2,000 years ago, it was a familiar image. There weren't banks for people to put their money in or their valuables. So rich people would hide their money in these expensive vases. Not the best strategy because thieves would break in and grab the most expensive looking stuff they could find, not knowing that in that they would find all kinds of cash. They weren't really stealing cash. They were stealing what looked to be expensive and only to find out, hey, this, not only is the base expensive, there's cash in it. So people started buying cheap pottery. And then they would store their money in these cheap things that nobody would want. That's what Paul's referring to here. So Paul uses this image of treasure stored in everyday jars of clay to show that God, to, to God's people that God puts the riches of his glory and his spirit and his power in us. Yes. It's not ours. It's his that he puts yes. in us. Amen. He puts his treasure in ordinary cracked pots. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. The problem is we get the treasure and the jar confused. We can think of the men and women of faith in, in recent times. I think Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake. And, you know, you pick your own favorite who, who, who's done, you know, miraculous things. You've seen John Wesley and others. Or maybe like the Brownsville Revival or, or Toronto or, or even Azusa Street. Amen. And we see these things. And, and they were used because we think that it, they were used because of their gifts or because of their ability. Because they had some special anointing. But if you watch and read those things, all of those revivals ended because it became about the men that were promoting the revival. Right. 
instead of about what the revival was about in the first place. I'm not against the revivals. I'm just saying we've elevated individuals instead of recognizing this was a thing of God. Yes. And he had to have somebody to use, so he used them. Yes. Only once they got used, they thought, now I really am special, you know. And so they start promoting themselves and everything goes flat. Yeah. If we think it's about them, we've totally missed the point. That's why God shows us the, the, the weakness of these people that he used throughout the scripture. It's so that we don't try to elevate ourselves, but we recognize, hey, these guys are all men and women. They were all failures. They were all flops without God. Yeah. It was their weakness that God was looking for so that his strength could be made perfect. And people would know, hey, I've known Moses since he was, I was a kid. This guy stutters and stammers. He doesn't have any courage. You know, I don't know. Don't send me. Send, send, have my brother go with me and he can talk for me. And, you know, all the kind of stuff that, that a normal human being would do. And then, then we look back and we go, Moses, what a wonderful man of God. He was a wonderful yeah. man of God. But it was God, not Moses. Yeah. You know, it's like looking at a briefcase stuffed with a million dollars and thinking the value is in the briefcase. Separate from the money. It's like, man, I'd love to have that briefcase. Dump that stuff out of this so I can take that briefcase and use it. The truth is, any impact these people had on others' lives wasn't because of them, but it was because of the treasure that was in them. Yes. It was because of the God that yes. was in them. Yes. The weaker we are, the more we lean on God for strength. Yes. We know that, especially when we get into a crisis. Yeah. I mean, we can do some things and be fairly successful yeah. but then you get smacked right square in the face with something you can't do anything about yeah. and you realize how weak you really are yes. and that's when you turn to God yes. and that's when God's strength is made perfect that is right. the more broken we are the more cracks there are for the glory to pour out of yes. the history of the church hasn't ever been about great men and women of God it's always been about a great God of men and women yes. praise the Lord because of the grace of God, when we are weak, He is strong. Yes. If God's power is really made perfect in my weakness, then the pressure isn't on me. That's right. exactly. Amen. That's right. The glory belongs to Him. Yes. And because of that, anything's possible. Yes. We are supernatural, Tammy. Yes. We are supernatural. Yes. And a supernatural life isn't walking around with pumped up confidence, throwing power bombs at people, right. and giving the impression that only a few can do this. Right. Yeah. That's right. mm -hmm. Instead, it's, it's a life that's available to anybody. Yep. Amen. All we need to do is depend on God. Yep. Trusting His power will work in my vulnerability. Sure. Yes. If God loves to use the weak, it means He loves to use you and me. <laughs> I've had some supernatural things happen, and I've talked about it before. And I've got to tell you, early on, a young man that I prayed for that had been declared dead of uh, diabetes, had a diabetic, uh, was in a diabetic coma, and then he passed away. Prayed for him. He was out of the hospital in two days and had no diabetes. Now, I don't think he ever came to the Lord, but I've got to tell you, for a while there, I thought, man, Nate, you've hit on something here, buddy. This, this could take you a long way. Now, I wasn't being, you know, totally focused on that, but yet at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, whoa, buddy, yeah. you just did something people don't do. Right. Yeah. But the problem is, I prayed for others. Uh -huh. And I didn't see any result. Now, how do you justify that? Yeah. It's because in my strength, I thought I could do this. God's already given me something special here to, yeah. that I could do this, only to find out, it wasn't me. Yeah. I didn't have anything to do with it. The only thing I had to do with it, I was the vehicle. I was just the, yes, the you know, the vehicle that, to get him to that place. Yes. Amen? Yeah. And I think so, some, we get so full of ourselves, there's no room for God. And that's when we see failure. That's when we get disappointed. That's when we get discouraged. Because we're not really depending on God anymore. I was so freaked out when I went to that hospital. I was crying, I was praying in tongues, I was doing everything, because I didn't even know how to deal with it. It was a big Catholic hospital, there was nuns and priests and everything all over, all over the place. I didn't know what to say to anybody. I was tongue-tied, I, I just felt like a complete idiot. I mean, I did. And I went into the room where the family was, and I said, well, let's just pray. Because the reason I said let's pray, not because I was so spiritual, but I was afraid they were going to ask me for advice, or they were going to ask me for some spiritual, you know, 
And so I thought, let's just pray because that'll get the, the, the heat off of me. And everybody started praying in tongues. Even the, the nuns were praying. All of a sudden, they just all started praying in tongues. And I thought, whoa, praise the Lord. And I just left and went upstairs to where the kid was in the ER. Or not ER, but in the, uh, what do you call it? I see you, that's it. And um, just went and prayed. They had a sheet over him already, and I figured, well, I got nothing to lose here, you know, and there's nobody except a couple of doctors who were probably atheists watching. And when I prayed, and that sheet started moving, it's powerful. But it wasn't me. I had already told everybody, I mean, in me, I had already told God and everybody else, you have no business even being here. You're, the only reason you're up here praying for him is because you were afraid to stay there with the family that they were going to start asking you questions that you couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. So it was more of an escape thing for me than it was really trying to be supernatural. Yeah. The truth is, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Yes. When we know that we can't do anything about this, then we have to rely on him. And that's when God moves. God wants the glory. And it's not because he's selfish. No. It's because if we have the glory, we don't know how to handle it. Right. Exodus 33, verse 19. Moses is wanting to see the glory, you know. We all want to see the glory. And he said, I, God responds to him. He said, I'll make all my goodness. Now look, at here's how God responds to Moses wanting to see his glory. He doesn't go, bam, you know, and there's a light show and all of a sudden everything explodes and, you know, you can't see and there's everything moving around and it's all dramatic and outrageous. No, he says, okay, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. Now, it sounds like he's answering a question that Moses didn't ask. Moses said, show me your glory. And God says, I'm going to show you all my goodness. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So the three key words here are goodness, mercy, and compassion. Look at John 1, 14. Remember, he put his treasure in earthen vessels. And he said, oh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what did they find it in? A human who nobody believed was God, who believed he came from God or believed anything about it except for a few disciples. Right. Amen. And so God's glory is spectacular, but it's not always in this flashing lights and fire in the sky way that we, that we expect it. That's true. When he reveals his glory to Moses, he's revealing power, but not for the sake of just power or for power's sake alone. Amen. But God's power reveals his spectacular love, in the end, God's glory is his character. Yes. That's what we see in Jesus. Yes. His glory is made flesh. Yes. And what do we see? This perfect human. What a human being was designed to be in the first place. Full of love, mercy, and compassion. Yes. Who dealt with these disciples for three and a half years. And he had to be thinking, they're not ever going to get it. Yes. They're just too dense. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. See, a true revelation of God's glory, a genuine miracle, a great act of supernatural power is, gonna, is supposed to cause us to be awed by his character, by how good he is, by how merciful he is, by how compassionate he is. His goodness, his mercy, his compassion. A life full of the naturally supernatural is a life that's filled with God's love, and God's acceptance. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. John 14, verses 12 through 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. That's huge. Praise the Lord. Why don't we ask in our name? Because we're too weak. Our weakness forces us to turn to him. 
Mark 7, verse 13. We'll wrap up here. Mark 7, verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now, he, he wrote this to the Pharisees, but he could have easily written it to the 20th, 21st century uh, religious church. Because what that means, the only way we can see the promises of God fulfilled is by refusing to define ourselves according to anything but what God has said about us. You won't do this if you don't believe God's with you. And that it's what God wants for you. Amen. The Pharisees insisted on defining themselves in their world according to human standards or human interpretations. Amen. And practices instead of what the word of God said. And the word no effect, it simply means to render powerless. When we go by our traditions, when we think it's about us, whatever power you thought you had, you don't have. And you're going to find out in a big hurry that you don't have it. Amen. So let's wrap up here with these last two scriptures. Joshua 1 and 9. I have not commanded thee, have not I commanded thee. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And Nehemiah 9, verse 12. Nine twelve, Nehemiah. No. Oh, I'm sorry, eight twelve. I beg your pardon. I just love to correct. <laughs> and all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. When you understand the word, when you really understand what God is saying to you, You'll go out and have a party. You're going to celebrate, amen, and you're going to share with others the same thing that you have, amen, yes. and make great mirth, have great joy, be happy, yes. amen, because you understand the words yes. that were declared to you, yes. that God is love, yes. amen, that God will never forsake you, that your weakness is made perfect in his strength. Right. It's no longer about you. You can relax. Amen? Eat the fat and drink the sweet uh -huh. and get happy. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That sounds like, it sounds so contrary yeah. to what we think yeah. of in terms of spirituality. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. it's the very basis for it. Why else would God have designed all these special feasts and, uh, for Israel, yeah. you know, before the Gentiles were brought in? Why? Because the thing he wanted for them more than anything else was for them to enjoy life. Live your life and have fun. That's why Jesus came. Yes. And, and again, I'm not telling you to, to drink and get drunk and all. I'm just saying, if you do have a drink, God is not condemning you any more than he would condemn you for just going out and having a good time with your family someplace or just going somewhere, whatever it is you enjoy to do. He tells us, have a good meal. Enjoy a good meal. You know, have something that maybe, you know, the doctor's saying, yeah, you know, you shouldn't be eating all that barbecue. I'm not telling you to be stupid, but on the other hand, man, if you like it, eat it. Enjoy it. Yes. If you want to have a drink, yes, drink, have a drink. Don't be an idiot. I mean, don't get drunk and then be disrespectful and hateful to people and, yeah. and, 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 you know, not be responsible for your behavior and your family. But I'm saying, God, the things that we have called sin, God never called it sin. Yeah. It was us that made this up. That's right. And our traditions, amen, have kept us from fulfilling what God wants yes. us to do and being what God wants us to be. Amen. Again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not promoting alcohol and drugs or anything else. I'm just saying Jesus wants you to enjoy your life. That's right. He wants you to have a good time. Life isn't supposed to be something we go through just constantly grieving and groaning and moaning. And You know, you hear this, oh, these intercessors. Oh, God, help me. You know, and oh, my Lord, what are you going to do? Are you going to help me? Oh, what, are you, what are you doing? I'm interceding. For who? Yeah. Lighten up, man. Yes. I like the sign over my desk back there. Lose the drama. Yeah. He, he wants you to enjoy your life. Yes. yes. I mean, who, look, if, I'm, if I want somebody to, uh, 
you know, be my friend or be a, you know, a pal or whatever it might be. I don't go out and go, oh man, my life is such a miserable mess. And God, will you be my friend? And come on over to the house and let's just talk for a while about all my stuff, you know? And oh man, could I use a. No, they're going to run from you like, yeah. like you got the play. That's what we listen to, though, isn't it? Why? Because they don't know. They've got to have some example. They've got the people that, like you're talking about, Sheila. Yes, they've got issues. There's no question about it. We all know them, and we have some of our own. But the way you deal with it is not, oh no, my my my. No, the joy of the Lord is our strength. They need that strength. Yes. Amen. And the way to give it to them is by the joy of the Lord. That's right. Not that we're disregarding the, the, the seriousness of their situation, but that we're going to take it realistically that this right. is not impossible for God. Right. God can deal with this if you can believe God. And, it, and, and you know, we all have losses. We've lost family members and loved yeah. ones. I've lost uh, t- two brothers and a sister and both my parents. And I mean, I'm, I'm an older man, so I mean, th- those things are going to happen in, in the natural life. And yes, it's sad. It, it, it hurts. I still hurt sometimes when I think about it, you know. But listen, the joy of the Lord. I know where they are. Yeah. Amen. They're not missing me. No, no I'm serious. They're not. They're, I think about that with my grandkids and great-grandkids. The thing that concerns me about dying, not that we want to get into all this morbidity, but is not, you know, that I'm going to be missing them because I know I won't. It's hard to get that through your head when you're only in this world. The thing that worries me is how they will miss me. I don't want it to be a, a traumatic, horrible, frightening, you know, depressing thing for them. I want them to know Popo's okay. He's good. Well, he's not here right now, but you're going to see him again, and it's all going to be cool when you do. And if we don't give them that kind of, a, uh, you know, confidence, then they go through the rest of their lives sorrowful, fearful, who's going to be next, you know, and oh my God, I, I, you know, it shouldn't be that way. God is for us. Amen. And we're not going into into some big trip. I'm just stepping out of this thing into this, you know, I'm just going from here to here. I'm not going far. I'll be right by, right there. Amen. And the day will come. Bang. Just like that. We'll all be together. No time where I'm going, so I'm not going to be watching the clock or, or wringing my hands about, oh, no, what, how long is it going to be now? No, it just, there's no time. It'll just be now. Can you say praise the Lord? Let's go out, eat the fat, drink the, <laughs> drink the sweet, enjoy life, be an example of God's love, compassion, and mercy, and watch God work. In our weakness, His strength will be made perfect. Can you say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen, amen. He's a good God all the time. Hallelujah. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Enjoy the presence of the Lord.